Welcome. Welcome. Students, faculty, alumni, friends, thank you for joining us for this auspicious occasion. It is my pleasure as the Dean of the School of Diplomacy and International Relations to introduce Seton Hall University Provost and Executive Vice President, Dr. Larry Robinson. This is a wonderful opportunity for all of us, but especially for me as the Dean that was recruited by Dr. Robinson last year. And I want to say thank you to him uh, publicly in this occasion. I want to thank him especially for believing that the School of Diplomacy could be part of the university fully. And this event truly remarkably stayed this for all of us. Dr. Robinson. Thank you, Dean Bartoli, our distinguished guest, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Ms. Lehman Bowie. We have some regents here tonight, I understand. Mr. Ed Gwynn, I think, is in the audience. And also, I want to recognize and acknowledge Mr. Tom Sharkey and Ruth Sharkey, who have been major uh, contributors, not only serving a long time on our Board of Regents, but also very supportive in a number of ways uh, for our university and the School of Diplomacy. Also, I noticed Dean Strauser here tonight, and uh, I thank Vice President Bohan of Advancement, so we have a number of our colleagues here. And then it's my, I understand also that uh, the chair of our Board of Overseers, Diplomacy Board of Overseers, Dr. Milady, is here this evening, and I wanted to send a special greeting there. Also, our distinguished faculty, I noticed a number of you here this evening, our students and special guests. Good afternoon to all of you. On behalf of Seton Hall University and the School of Diplomacy and International Relations, we're deeply honored and pleased to have our guests on our campus today and you as well. I want to especially thank the fine efforts of the School of Diplomacy in hosting this special event. The School of Diplomacy in so many ways represents the best of what Seton Hall stands for. Our mission, quality, servant leadership, tradition, excellence, and values. Our faculty clearly and consistently establishes themselves among the finest assembled anywhere. They often serve as an exemplar of what high-minded faculty should represent, quality in their work, excellence in their mentoring, their instruction, and their research. The faculty of the school contribute daily to our historic and noble legacy. This event, your presence on this occasion, gives us the opportunity to showcase the many fine things that are going on in the School of Diplomacy. The School of Diplomacy represents a vital strategic presence on our campus. The school is a gateway to creating a presence and a vision worldwide. The heart of a great university is its faculty, and its soul are students. This event illustrates the fine efforts of a school recognized nationally for its continued efforts under the impressive leadership of Dean Bartoli. We are genuinely pleased you're here and look forward to this evening's festivities to all Welcome to Seton Hall University. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. I would like now to introduce Father Lawrence Frizzell. He's a director and associate professor of the graduate program in Jewish and Christian studies and the director of the Institute of Judeo-Christian Studies a leading center of expertise committed to the mission of developing, encouraging, 
and increasing the collaborative peace-building effort of Jewish and Christian scholars, theologians, educators, and students. He's also a dedicated uh, media person. He has, a, he has a radio program, and he was kind enough to in, in, uh, interview me the other day. Uh, we had wonderful uh, exchange, and he reminded me of how important it is for Catholics to, to keep thinking about peace, and how important it is to do so in conversation with other religions. So uh, let me welcome and ask you to welcome with me uh, Father Lawrence Frizel for the invocation. I always tell my students, the, the children that I teach on occasion, a bird needs two wings to fly. So we need work, and we try to be peacemakers, but we need prayer. So we acknowledge that we live in the presence of Almighty God. And we pray, Lord, our God, we live in a world of limitations and of potential a world of devastation and of hope, your gift of right order and justice that leads to true and lasting peace calls for our acceptance and collaboration. May all people of goodwill work in concord to imitate you in deeds that foster authentic peace. May the earnest and persevering prayer of women in many lands bring the divine gifts of tranquility and harmony to those engaged in leading nations and ethnic communities so that they will be open to the highest ideals. We pray that the efforts of Dr. Lema Bowie and her collaborators will contribute to a lasting peace in the nations of West Africa as people face the frightening scourge of disease May they be successful in halting its progress so that the afflicted may have complete healing. And we ask for divine blessings on Seton Hall's School of Diplomacy and on this new Center for Peace and Conflict Studies. And may all that we are and do be for the glory of your name. Amen. Thank you, Father Frizel. I like the idea of work and prayer together. I like the idea of the image of the two wings. It's good to fly, it's good to... It is my pleasure to be able to host and present to you Lima Bowie. I met Lima at Teachers College uh, when she was recently in conversation with Abby Disney and promoting the documentary that tells the story of the Liberian peace process and the role of the women that she led. Her enthusiasm was extraordinary then and is extraordinary now. So I'm happy that, quote unquote, a normal person became a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Somebody that... <laughs> somebody that encountered life and difficulties, it was not scared by them. Somebody that found divisions and very strong entrenched enmities and was not scared of them. Somebody that found extraordinary disparity and was not scared of them. I do believe that we need that courage to face the world as it is today to make it better. We have a dream for our school to make the school a great school for the good of all. Not just for us, not just for those who are close to us, but for everybody. 
We have recently launched the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at the school, and you met Professor Zhang Wang, the director of it. I cannot think of a more fitting guest speakers to help us celebrate the center launch than Lima. To learn about Lima's struggle through 14 years of civil unrest in Liberia and her instrumental role in leading the country to peace is a life-changing and transformative experience. Her subsequent work in peace building has continued to lead the way for students and scholars of peace and conflict studies. At Seaton Hall, our Catholic mission is to encourage and develop our students to be servant leaders in a global society. Lima's work and her new effort in Ebola education epitomize this idea of leadership in service of others, making an impactful difference in the world. Please join me in welcoming Lima Boy to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. I, I, I don't know about the normal part. Uh, some, some days I think I'm a little bit crazy, but I, I got hope the other day I go to church, to the Riverside Church in New York when I'm there, and there was a pastor from Union Seminary in Virginia who said, can we just go back to a little bit crazy because normal in this world today is killing and maiming of people. Crazy is when you dare to do good and to build peace. So I'd rather be crazy than to be normal. <laughs> Over the last few weeks, I've been going through many challenges. Three months, um, I lost my dad. And we've had his body in Ghana. Because of the Ebola, we can't get a flight to take him home. And so I'm sitting in my living room, and this is the first time for me as a mother of six children to be living in a house and solely caring for one. And my five-year-old is that one. And unfortunately for the two of us, she's learning the American way, and I'm as African as it gets. <laughs> so... I'm sitting in the living room and trying to structure my talk in my head. And she walks over to me and said, can you read me a story? I'm ready to go to bed. And I said, little girl, <laughs> today I'm in no mood to read stories. I, I think people will say that's really cruel. But that girl can try my patience. <laughs> and so right now, I'm thinking and I just want to sit in this chair. So there's two things I want to do, think and sit in a chair. And she looks at me and goes, actually, you forgot the third one. And I said, so what is the third one? Cry, because you've been crying every day for your father. Good night. <laughs> well, she didn't lie. I did a good bit of crying that night. And the next morning, I told her, thank you for reminding me to do the third thing, cry. But it's, 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 it's been a tough time, but the tough time has not stopped me from doing what I know to do best. Um, Hafiza, my assistant, is here. She's been a travel companion. Hafiza, they would like to see you. I think Hafiza has gone a bit crazy with me. She's been, we've been on this journey since I won the prize for three years. I survive on three hours of sleep. And so when I wake up in the middle of the night and have a thought, I go straight to the email. And the first time, I think she thought she had an easy job until she started receiving mails at 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning. And she started asking herself, who is this woman? Six children now a husband, and she still can't sleep. But where we find our world makes it difficult for anyone to relax, let alone take a vacation. I'm humbled to be here tonight. I'm honored to be here. I thank God, and I thank you, Father, for 
your wonderful prayer. And if you ever start praying and you can't get Jesus, know that I'm holding up the line because I've been calling him a lot lately. <laughs> I want to say thank you to Andrea, who I consider a part of my New York family, a part of my U.S. family, and to Provost Robinson and to the board for taking the risk of inviting me here. I know it's a lot because um, I'm told I'm the first woman to do the World Leaders Forum, and I'm hoping that... I'm hoping that I can do a good job. And Hafiza, can you make a list of 10 women who will be potential candidates for, <laughs> so that we leave it with the school, just in case they're having a hard time finding women to come and do this work, because definitely I'm not the last. So into, it, I grew up in a country, Liberia, where we had war. I was 17 when the war started in, 2000, in 1989 fresh out of high school with a lot of dreams. I wanted to be a pediatrician. I wanted to, to, to have a white fence, have only two kids, and marry my high school sweetheart. So I had it all planned in my head, the way life was going to play out. And then we had the war. And the war had some devastating effects on dreams and hopes of many young people. And I remember the first day that I actually felt the war was in the July of 1990 on a day my mother left to go to work. My sister, my older sister who's deceased now, drove along with her. And I was home with my nieces and nephew. Their mother didn't live in our house, but my parents took care of them. And they left and went. By 10 because I was waiting for my class time at the University of Liberia. So I'm sitting there waiting, timing myself by 12. I will get dressed. I have a 2 o'clock class till late that evening. 10 o'clock, sporadic shooting. There was this old man who was internally displaced and living in our house. And he said, I know that sound. The rebels have entered the city. And in split seconds, bullets were flying in the yard, and so I had to gather the children. I tell people from eight in the morning to 10 o'clock, I was a teenager. From 10 till this day, I became an adult in a matter of hours. Being the only child of my parents at the house at that time with the younger siblings, automatically the burden for caring for internally displaced people from our church community, from our ethnic group, from other places, fell on me. So I had to now oversee the feeding of over 25 individuals in our house. I had to oversee different things. And the only thing I kept saying to myself was, I can't wait for my mother to come home and take over her job. Four days later, she came home, totally traumatized, unable to do anything. In my mind, I kept screaming, it's not fair. It's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair. I'm still a child. But I would scream in my mind, but I would have to take actions to safeguard the family. Eventually, I came to realize that I had to also be the thinker because my mother could not think. She was too traumatized to think. So I would leave from where we were to go and look for food, like walk five hours and come back and do food. And eventually they started calling me the taxi cab of the house because I would wake up six in the morning and by 12 noon I would be back with something because I had mastered that walking. And once a bullet fire, I had no care for food. Once I had a glass of water, it was okay for me for the day. And that's how I would go and keep going. But as I navigated life and tried to safeguard my family, my father was somewhere else. Siblings were another place. I kept, I kept getting angrier. And the anger would not go away because for me, it is not fair. I'm 17. I shouldn't be doing this. I'm 17. Someone should be doing this for me. 
And that anger stayed with me, and I would tell people later on that I made some crazy decisions in life. But later on, that same anger would be the fuel that I would need to begin working with a group of women to build peace. So in 2003, we started a mass action campaign where seven women with 10 US dollars, seven women who were fed up, seven women who had lived all of their lives going through war. I was 17, and by 2003, I was 31. So an entire lifetime of seeing dead people, of seeing family members being killed, of being sexually harassed. I was never raped but harassed. I remember I would get to a checkpoint and there was this man at this checkpoint whose favorite thing was before I passed, I had to give him a kiss. And boy, was he ugly. <laughs> oh, it's easy to kiss a strange, handsome man. But the most difficult thing was to kiss a very ugly man. I mean, really ugly, that face that would give you nightmares. And every time I got to the checkpoint, he would go, my girlfriend is here, and kiss me. So I would close my eyes and be like, mm. Eventually, a friend of mine, who was my childhood friend, came one day and saw him and said, her, she had a friend who was the commander. The next time you harass my friend, I'll make them kill you. So it became an easy pass for me. Every time I pass, he say, the CEO knows this girl. Go, you are trouble. You know, so that anger of being harassed, there were many women in our, in our small group who had seen relatives died, and we decided, you know what? We've sat down for too long. We will do something. We need to do something because it is important for us to take a step out of our role as victims and not start to play the role as survivors. If we die, the narrative will be we die trying. And so we started doing this work. But the question many people ask every time, is this the first time? And I just want you to journey with me on the topic tonight of the butterfly effect, local actions, helping informing global responses. People think that the Liberian Women's Movement is the first. But in the early 1900s, 1929, 28 to be specific, Nigeria was under a colonial rule, and the Brits were in charge of Nigeria. And in 1928, they passed a taxation law, but this law was going to affect only the men. And no one had a problem with it, so it passed without any problem. In 1929, they decided to pass a law taxing women. And there were three women who decided we're not having any of this. So they decided to mobilize women. Those were the days of no cell phones. And I'm sure if you ever told someone there would be an equipment that you would use to call someone miles away, they would say, that is witchcraft. <laughs> but those women used the palm branches as a means of mobilizing. They were able to mobilize 10,000 women. 10,000 to protest taxation. And they convened and they were protesting this new ordinance peacefully. And then some of the women got killed. The number increased to 25,000 women. And these women want, went on a rampage. So in the history of Nigeria, you have where they call the Abba Women's War. And that war went on to the effect that they went, took over prisons, burned down courthouses, government buildings, and everything. But for almost a year, these women decided we're not going to stop because this is unfair. Later on, they would disregard the whole taxation of women. Some officials would get fired, but at the end of the day, their will and pleasure stood. In many parts of the world, since the end of the Cold War, We've seen wars and wars and wars. 
You know, the Cold War ended in the one debris they left behind were small arms and leg weapons, AK-47, rocket-propelled grenades. And so countries in Africa specifically who had all of this dissatisfaction decided the way to solve this problem, if I can get an AK-47 for $5, I will start a war. A few months back, I was in Mozambique, and I was sitting with um, Bishop Dennis Sangolani. Bishop Sangolani is the person who really worked during the Mozambican War to bring peace. And we were having dinner, and Bishop Sangolani has a very good sense of humor. He started laughing and said, Lema, with all of your activism, if someone walked into this restaurant with a gun, we'll just start running. I said, that's true, Bishop. He said, but you know the strange thing about it? We won't even know if the gun works. He said, and I think most times, a lot of these fighters that terrorize communities come in with weapons that don't work, but just the sight of the weapon send all of us going helter-skelter. So at the end of the Cold War, you have all of these weapons that people decided to hold and to use as a means of bringing war on people. Liberia had his fair share of the war. I talked about being 17 when the war started. Sierra Leone, Burundi, all of these different countries had gone through war. One factor or one characteristic that all of these countries share is the media image, the image of the people who survived the war. Women and children were primarily seen as victims, weak. And most of the media images first talked about or showed the boys with the guns, especially for Liberia, the ones eating the hearts of human beings, the ones that got pregnant women, and if they ever showed women, they were showing women who were telling stories of rape. No one showed any different narratives. Today, it continues. But in many of these communities that had gone through war, there were local actions. Local actions that primarily served as the impetus for the global responses in those countries. So for example, we had signed 14 peace agreements in Liberia. 14, one four, and we couldn't find peace. We had gone through the 14 peace agreement, I think represents one year every of the war, but the 14 peace agreements were signed between 1990 and 1997. No peace. We crazily elected Taylor as president of Liberia in 1997. And then we went back to war. And when we went back to war, again the narrative began. The narrative of women as victims of war, the narrative of child soldiers, the narrative of many different things. But in these communities, Liberia, there were women mobilizing. Every day, we were coming together to make our voices heard. I remember the first time we came together and wrote a statement. We were very clear that this statement had to name us, name the seven of us. If we're taken tonight and we're killed, let the record show that these seven women were killed because they dare to condemn the war. The next morning, we gain such, so one minute, here we are, pathetic looking women, as an international media person would call us. And the next minute, we're local celebrities. Because everyone, the, 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 the children in Liberia say local heroes or local champions. Everyone wanted to know who these seven women were, daring Charles Taylor. We name ourselves press conferences, and we decided, let's expand our group. The next meeting time, we had about 15. The third meeting, 65. The fourth meeting, 250. When we decided to outdo, 2,500 women showed up. But the beauty of that was that even as we were doing these local actions and pushing ourselves and doing everything, the international community was still failing. You know, my mother always said the meaning of insanity is doing one thing over and over and expecting a different result. So all of the action and the peace talks that they had done in the past was the same old strategy. No one thought 
Let's look for a new group of players to bring at the table. One of the days we went and we heard, oh, the international crisis group was meeting. I had, we had these two young women who were the only young women in our group. They decided, Madam Bowie, today we give our paper. So local actions, crazy. We have a statement, three-point statement. It was the peak of the rainy season in Liberia. We laminated those papers and carried them in our blouses. Just in case we meet someone who's interested, we hand it to them. So we get to the UN office where all of these high-profile people from the US, from the EU, from ECOWAS, different places were meeting. And these two young ladies said to me, we're crossing the street. So we are across here and they're there. And we have our placards. But then we have these heavy machine guns facing us, just in case we decide to make trouble. And I told them, don't try it. They didn't even wait for the try it to come out of my mouth. They shout straight across the street. You know, Europeans are very curious people. <laughs> Americans are nice, but they don't take risks. I meant that in a good way. <laughs> the Swedish ambassador was peeping through the crack in the fence of where they were having the meeting. And he was motioning to someone that there are a group of women out there and we need to see what they're about. And my two girls were walking straight and the armed men were telling them to move out of the way by that time, this Swedish ambassador was outside and they had their statement waving. And he said, what do you have then? They said, we brought this for you, sir. He took it and asked, do you have more I want to give to my friends? And they hurriedly came across the street and were whipping them out of our clothes. <laughs> they took it back to them. But after we gave those statements, one of the ambassadors decided he would be an ally. And this is the beginning of our action, helping to inform the global response for peace in Liberia. So every time we had, or there was a big delegation coming, this ambassador would call and say, tomorrow you want to protest at this point because there were big people coming. Or you want to go to the US embassy and spend the whole day there picketing. And eventually, and this is what local action does, the narratives of boys with guns eating hearts was beginning to change to the narrative of women who were determined against all odds to build peace. So this is the Liberian story. There are three group of women, three women in, in, in Ghana who started something called the African Women's Development Fund. These women were in the diaspora in the UK and they had gotten so fed up of seeing people, Western donors trying to influence the way African women structure their programs. So these women decided we're going to start the first ever grant making organization for African women. And this would be something that we'll call the African Women's Development Fund. They fund anything and everything. If you wake up in the morning and you have a program, you have a good justification with a contextual analysis, you're sure to get some funding from them. They decided, let's do something locally that will also help to inform the global response to the way African women's issues are treated. In many of our communities, I can go on giving you examples of local initiatives that have gone out to do great things. Today, the narrative you all get about DR Congo is that it is the rape capital of the world. February, I was privileged to lead a delegation of Nobel women to DR Congo, or our supporters, and I was the only Nobel laureate on the delegation. We had a lot of international media people with us. And it was so amazing because I, I tell people I walk into every space with all of my Africanness. I don't leave anything behind. 
So my antenna is up as an African survivor of war. My antenna is up as an African peace activist. My antenna is up as a mother of six, an African mother of six. My antenna is up as a daughter who never had a brother growing up and had to fight for everything. So all in all of my Africanness, and sometimes they come with a bit of style. <laughs> so we get to this place and people, one of the places we went, there were 50 women in the room and they were talking about the abuse that they had encountered. 50 stories of rape. The tears was unimaginable. So I begin to walk from one person to the other, touch and hug and hold hand and touch and hug. But as they told their story, I had to go back to my seat and take my red notepad that I think eventually when I do something great in my life will sell for a lot of money on eBay. <laughs> because I have all of my crazy notes in there. So once I do great things in this world, look out, it will be on eBay. I haven't done anything yet. So I took my notepad and started to do a graph of the narrative. I was raped. I wanted to end my life. And the women showed up. My situation changed. They took me to a doctor, gave me clothes. I have hope. One, I was raped. The women showed up. So in all of the 50 narratives, there was a fine thread of hope, not hopelessness. But then every other reporter that would raise their hand to ask these women question, how many times were you raped? And they would go on. Yes, I was raped four times. But today I can live because the women came. No one stopped to ask, who were those women? What did they do? How did they get the resources? And how can we use this local action to influence a global response to the crisis in Congo? Take a step back. I'm in Kenya. I did a crazy flight. Chicago, Qatar, Qatar, Nairobi, get there 2 in the morning, 7 a.m., I'm up for a meeting with a group of African women. We call ourselves the Friends of Southern Sudan. We stay in meeting from 9 in the morning to 8 p.m., pick up my bed, back on the flight, Nairobi, Qatar, Qatar, New York. And then I'm sitting in the living room, debriefing Hafiza about my trip. And she said, are you not sleepy? No, I'm excited. So what's the excitement? I'm placed by the grace of God and through no work that I've done with five of the most fascinating African women who understands the Southern Sudanese crisis back and front. And I'm just there to Google for them because they are old and they don't understand the computer the way I do. <laughs> and trust me, I don't understand it either. So this was the case of in the land of the blind, the one eye man is the giant. <laughs> I'm sitting in that room with people with all of the knowledge you need. There were, there were three of these women who spent their lives following John Garang when they had the time. Gertrude Mongela, Phoebe Ocello, Professor Wanjura, of the Women's um, Leadership Program at Makerere University. These women would lay back in their seats with their cup in their hand and say, 1970, this, Oslo, Norway, blah, 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 blah. That was the essence of Garang's speech. Google it and you go to Google and see it there. I'm sitting in that room and saying to myself, why are they not the mediators of the Southern Sudanese crisis. Why don't we have these women? Betty Begumbi knows half of the generals in the Southern Sudanese war, and she tells us in this meeting, 
we knew when the war was going to start on December 15. But every local action met a stiff global response. She said first when the, the Southern Sudanese people signed the bill to have a nation, we went to them and told them we have the blueprint for this country. We can do it right if you follow us. And everyone else told them no. The argument was they do not need infrastructure development. What they need is an intense period of nation building. Here is a group of people who have been at war for almost all of their lives. Every home in this country owns an AK-47. If you take away the known enemy and never bring them to the place where they are able to live in peace, there will be an invisible enemy, and in a few short years, they will fight each other. And people said, we need roads in Juba, we need hospitals, we need schools, we need buildings, and the rest of this narrative is history. Because last December, we woke up on the 15th and heard about the war in South Sudan. Till today, the preliminary report from the African Union's Commission of Inquiry is sickening. The number of abuse and killings that took place in a short space of time. Some people are saying the leaders of that country are now worth to lead a pack of dogs. That's how bad it is. But it is bad because people fail to heed to the need for local action to inform some of the local crisis. Using a global response and putting aside local action will always lead you to a place where you will pour money and pour money and pour money. At the end of the day, the narrative will be these people just don't want peace. I'll give you a story, a crazy story. In Liberia, there's a community where a group of donors and partners went and they saw these women walk from one village to the other to get water to drink, to fetch water. And they decided, oh my God, these poor women walking for hours to get drinking water without consultation, without local import, they built a hand pump in the middle of the village. Several months later, another group came in to assess the life of women after the hand pump and realized that almost all of the women in the village have turned to alcoholics. Why? Well, a lot of us live in domestic violent situation. A lot of us have husbands who cheat. A lot of us have children who have lost their way. And on and on, the regular problems that women face when we woke up in the morning and took our water pots, we shared our problems one way and found solution another way. You put a hand pump here. We have nowhere to share our problem. We have no way of engaging. So we just drown our sorrows in alcohol. When global response push aside local action, the butterfly effect is almost like a backlash to the community. So what do we do? And most times when I find myself on university campuses, I say to young people, it's important for you to start local. I went to a college a few years back in Pennsylvania, and the young men wanted to show me enthusiastically how they've gone to Africa to build homeless shelters. But the city we found ourselves in was Philadelphia. I wasn't impressed. 
I honestly wasn't impressed and I wasn't being mean. How do you leave and go thousands of miles away and build homeless shelter when homelessness is sitting in your lap? That's hypocrisy. <laughs> and at that same school, someone asked me, what can we do for women in Africa? How can we support them? How can we give them ideas? I said to that person, unfortunately, women in Africa need no idea. They have it. Their resources is their problem. You have resources, ideas are your problem. <laughs> so, it is the typical saying in Sierra Leone and Liberia, want, want, no, get, 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 no, want. Mm? I want, I can't get, I get, I can't want, I don't want. So how do we balance this, young people? Because someone say, what is the difference between the young people in Africa and the young people in New York that you, you, you interact with at Barna, at Columbia, at other places? I say, there's no difference. The hope I have that keep me awake every night is the fire I see in young people globally. But how do we change that? I always say to young people, start your own local action. There is something, someone asked me the same question at the press briefing, and I told them, you're in New Jersey for heaven's sake, I don't have to say more. <laughs> This is Jersey. <laughs> and the problems you will see in Africa, you will see some of the similar problems in Jersey. A few years ago, someone brought me to Rutgers where they had a session for young girls. And you would have thought, I would have thought I was in Liberia because the situations were the same, the issues were the same, and they wanted to show me that I was African, and I was determined to show them that there was no road that they had traveled that I had not passed on. By the end of the week, we were buddies. So there are things that you can do locally to generate global response or to inform global response. Some of the challenges, though, to, global, to local action there is a huge fight for legitimacy. In Liberia, when we started, we couldn't get the recognition we needed on, on most of the mainstream media because people didn't see us as a legitimate group. And most times, this is what happened to local actions. People need other people to vouch for your legitimacy. The sad state is that in your local community, you have that legitimacy. But this is how normal, quote unquote, our world has become. Where it matters, people really do not pay attention to it. Funding is always a problem for local action. Sometimes people think, as a Nobel laureate, you haven't made, you get money. No, I still wake up and write grand proposal to women's organization. I still have to do what I have to do. But for me, as a grassroots activist, I'm grateful because I tell people things that you don't fight for, you always take it for granted. So anything that is hard-earned and hard-won, you cherish every moment of it. So that's the second challenge to local action. The third challenge is if you think you're ever going to get on, so any, get any kind of publicity, you miss the mark. Hafiza and I have been ripping our heads, hair, when we think about the Ebola crisis. There are local women's groups that have been doing great work. They have never been featured on any of the US news outlet. There are few Americans who are there doing small community work, and they set up giving challenge for them and say they are doing great work. I know of women who have taken plastic bags and 
This is how they move from one community to the other, teaching other women how to use them as personal protective equipment. No one features them. That is a challenge. There are groups that have been on the forefront, on the front line of caring for orphans or documenting orphans, and no one is featuring them. That is a serious challenge to local action. And sometimes when you're lucky enough for someone to feature your story, someone say, did it really happen? Because I didn't read it in the New York Times. Duh. <laughs> but you have all of these challenges. And the question you want to ask yourself, with all of these challenges, are women stopped? Or are they stopping? Or are communities stopping from carrying out the local actions? The answer is a resounding no. From Congo to Burundi to Rwanda to other places, these women continue because they know this is not a day's job. It is a way of life. And this is something that they have to do if they have to change the tide. And so I know that many of you in this room, the young people will graduate, and because you live in one of the blessed countries in the world, you will become ambassadors, and you will become great people let your actions always be guided by the thought that there are people locally who can do this. In 2003, after the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in Liberia, everyone expected the women to go back home and start taking care of children. And we were back in the streets. And then people would come to us and say, what do you want again? We've given you peace, and the answer was no. There's a comprehensive peace agreement, and we need to see that that peace agreement is implemented. So it was time for disarmament and demobilization of fighters. Boy, I know we have some officials who sit at the UN in the room, and some of you will sit there in the future. Sometimes you ask yourself, where do these people get their strategies? The strategy that was being employed in, December, in 2003, between October and November, to create the awareness with fighters that disarmament was about to begin, was to take a whole bunch of leaflets and get in a plane and fly over villages and drop them. Can they read? <laughs> How do they know? What you have, and some people were, were just fascinated to be holding papers falling from the sky. <laughs> As women, we went to them and said, we want to be a part of this. No, 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 no. And we had a very opinionated um, SRSG at the time. He was an American who had been in the army, a former general, and he felt like that place was his ranch, and whatever he said would go. I love him because we became friends, but at the price of his suffering. <laughs> so we got to him and said we could do this. No, 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 no. The first day of disarmament, we get to the place, and this was supposed to be symbolic. So they needed only 300 fighters to symbolically disarm. But the papers that were dropped didn't say only 300 should show up. So over 3,000 showed up. There were no water, no food, nothing. We came in tow with 80 fighters from a community where mothers had asked us to escort their sons to be disarmed. So we had 80 fighters and over 10 rest bags filled with ammunition. We get there, and we're standing, watching. We get there at 11, the sun is up. You're disarming, and they're smoking weed, drinking alcohol with AK-47. I say to my mentor, Sugars, we're going to have trouble today. By three, shooting erupts. 
The 80 boys we took to be disarmed now had to be our protector. Took their guns and escorted us. The next morning, we took every situation into our own hands. We went to the generals of Taylor's group. We went to the radio station, put women on the radio, speak your local vernacular, calling on your sons. And eventually, we went to the SRSG. He was so deflated because that was the biggest loss to his prestige. His first major challenge had hit a brick wall, and we sat with him and beautifully read the statement about his failure to do things the right way, and he had to sit there and listen to us. <laughs> the next day, he calls a meeting and say, turn over every awareness and sensitization of the peace process to the Liberian women because they know too much. We took it on with a challenge. We formed women from every 16 ethnic group and deployed them into the 15 counties. And they were using their local vernacular to tell fighters what to do. Today, that local action has informed a global response to DDR. Not only do they have a document about engaging local women in awareness and sensitization, but they have a document based on their experience from Liberia on how this entire process should be rolled out. It's not rocket science. Trusting local people to deal with their issue. The Aba Women's Riot in Nigeria set the basis not only for future riot, but for a recognition by the colonial masters that people also had an opinion, even if they were being ruled by iron hand, on where and what they wanted to do. Usually, when you let local action guide global or inform global responses, what you see is an empowered and confident community that is willing and able to respond to future problems. You have an institutionalized process of peace building. Before I left Liberia in 2005, I had done my work. I wanted to come to school to test if my actions had any academic basis or there was any legitimacy in the work that I did. So I came to do a graduate degree. I decided to do a project proposal building peace huts in all of the communities that women had protested. So the peace hut was supposed to serve as a memorial for the women's protest. It was also supposed to serve as a space that legitimized their work, but it was also supposed to serve as the institution recognized for building community peace. Today, again, in many writings of UN women, the peace hut is the new model for post-conflict women's engagement and the implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1325. The impact or the effect or the butterfly effect of local action informing global responses is also unity, peace, and a strong sense of community. One of the communities that we work in where women were actively involved and have institutionalized their peace process, today in Liberia, that community is the model. Every guest that comes to Liberia and they want to showcase positive community engagement, people go there. They have stories of rape, and the way they handle their rape crisis in their community is that people who have cases come to the women. The women have a group of women who institute arrest. The alleged perpetrator come to their peace hut. He is investigated by women, and if they find any fault with him, they turn him over to the local police. But there is such, it is such a good model, and this community has such a strong sense of unity and cooperation. There goes my headgear. <laughs> okay, 
I have to fix this. <laughs> have a strong sense of unity and cooperation that in many of the communities, in that particular community today, people really are so excited. Last time there was a suggestion that the police was not doing a good work and the justice system was not doing a good work. So they were asking government to allow the women to be a part of the justice system, sit on juries and do other things. But these are people who started local action for peace, informing global responses. It's been 10 years since the war ended in Liberia and this particular community has never stopped. It's, like I said, it's not rocket science. Peace is a process, it's not an event. People going through conflict and crisis, even here in this country, are not dummies. They know their issues, and they have a sense of what it is to fix those issues. All we need to do in the world that we live in is have some confidence in local people's ability to roll out their process of rebuilding, to roll out their process of healing. And if we allow it, we may just be lucky enough to see those processes or those local action as a new model for social order in our world. I want to thank you all and I'll take questions. that uh, you are taking questions. I'm sure that we have some of them. Uh, please. Hello, Madam Board. My name is Francesca Rodolado. I'm a sophomore at the School of Diplomacy. And my question is, um, what have been the most challenging obstacles in sustaining interest, both domestically and internationally, in the peace process? as well as um, sustaining the loyalty of the members of the movement, and how can these be overcome? Sustaining the loyalty of the members of the movement has never been a problem. Those of us who did the work that we did in 2003 up until today knows that we have a mandate, and the mandate is to do peace in our community. The mandate is to ensure that our children have a secure future. So with that mandate in the back of our heads, we mobilize at the snap of a finger. So we still have that, and we're still able to do that. If I tell you that we haven't been polarized a bit based on the politics of Liberia, we have a female president, and obviously there will be some people who will take sides and others who will take, but when it comes to crucial and fundamental issues relating to the rights of women, the rights of girls, justice issue, there is no side. We all come together, mobilize, and do what we need to do. Sustaining the momentum and, and working on the peace process. Some of the challenges that we have today is that we, I hate to, to go there, but we, whilst our work was successful and we're able to have Africa's first female president, I think that particular aspect has been one of the huge problem to our existence. Why? Like I mentioned earlier, you have a group of women who believe that women should not be critical of a female president. She's our president and let's just leave it, whether good or bad. And then you have a few group of us who say no. If it was a man, we'll be protesting. If it is a woman, and if we intend for the world to take us seriously on this leadership issue, let's be objective and not subjective. So you, you, you see a huge divide, unfortunately, you know, um, that challenges the work that we have to do. Because you know, peace is not just the absence of war. Peace is ensuring that we have a strong democracy. Our country is 168 years old, and this is the first time in over 100 years that we've had a woman president. And some of us are of the mindset that we need to challenge, we need to reprimand, and we also need to commend where they do something good because we don't want this to be the last time we have a woman's president. So that is a huge challenge. 
The other thing that we have is that we have a country that has resources, but um, we have a lot of mis, um, mispriorities. Today, we still have a huge population of fighters that have not been rehabilitated. We, we still have problems with basic infrastructure, basic um, social services for people. The Ebola crisis in Liberia went out of hand because we had nine years of no one paying attention to the healthcare system in that country. So you have those challenges and you know that issues of basic human security primarily leads to crisis. And the first thing any government should do after a period of intense fighting is focus on that and also focus on healing the wounds of people. We haven't even started as a nation to do reconciliation yet. So I can go on naming. We've done a few things, and one of the biggest achievements of our government is that they have a huge international recognition. So even as I stand here, I probably have 10 persons or more in this room who thinks that there's nothing that our government can do wrongly. And that has been one of the challenges when you as a leader in that country step out globally and try to point out that, yes, you may love this group of people, and we all do, but let's be honest, there are certain things that you need to help them do right, and that's the challenge. <laughs> Little girl, do you still have more? No, thank you. All right. Good evening. Um, uh, my brother Donald Payne was a congressman Payne who uh, became known as uh, Mr. Africa. And my brother believed in peace and uh, always, and I was curious, during his tenure in office, he from time to time mentioned uh, what was going on in Liberia and that he was involved to some degree with some of the people there. I don't know whether you ever uh, met him uh, or whether or not you knew of what he was doing, but I just might say that Don, uh, President Clinton said of my brother, Don Payne believed peace was better than war. He believed it was better to build than to break. He believed it was better to reconcile than to uh, resent. He just kept building, and I just wondered whether or not you had an opportunity to meet him. Uh, by the way, he's an alumnus of Seton Hall University, and his Donald Payne papers are going to be are going are housed here now. I'm curious as to know whether or not you. Uh, know of anything, and we have a foundation that we're establishing in his name. I definitely met Congressman Payne. Um, we were at an event, not here in Jersey, but Chicago, and it was a, a lot of fanfare. I wasn't a Nobel laureate then, but he took up the time to meet with me once someone said, this is a women's rights activist from Liberia. And I know that when he passed, the Liberian community tried to make their presence felt because and there were a lot of obituaries in local papers and online, on Liberian, um, local Liberian papers that um, people had um, done. I see some people looking like Liberians wanting to ask questions. Elizabeth, give them a chance. <laughs> I'll take anything. Go ahead, go ahead. Avenel Davis, I'm a sophomore at the School of Diplomacy, and my question is, having worked with refugees and having yourself been a war refugee for a short time, do you feel that our current system of refugee resettlement works? And if not, do you believe that the policy should be made at the global level um, or at the regional level, or both? I think the policy should be made at, oh, girls. I think the policy should be made at both the regional and the global level. I, I think we still have a long way to go when it comes to addressing problems with refugees um, in terms of humanitarian aid, in terms of resettlement and repatriation, even in terms of the relationship in host countries. I, I, I think there's a lot more that needs to be done and people need to start begin to look at it from the regional level. I think at the regional level, if there were countries who were willing to host people and had a policy for a good lifestyle, I doubt if people would be looking for a third country because I know as a refugee, I was always praying for a day when I would leave Ghana and go back to Liberia. Some people just want to be close to home. 
And some people don't necessarily want to opt for a third country if the opportunities for education, for employment, all of these different things are readily available. But most times in the region, you don't find it. Most times in the region, there's a lot of hardship. So I think it, it, it should be a, a close, in close uh, concert with one another. That's my take on it. Thank you. Thank you. Let me take from these ladies and then I'll take from anyone else. Um, how can I organize a group of g elementary girls to become their grade representative? Better what? Their grade, f their grades, um, rep representative. Someone help me. Translation. <laughs> I'm African. <laughs> Oh! Hmm. I think first we need to start by having conversation with the girls and letting them know that girls too can be leaders. And we need to... And we need to take some women leaders from in the communities and take them to these girls to sit with them and have a conversation about leadership. If I wasn't on my way to Africa, I would volunteer myself to sit with your class, but I have a dad to bury. So can we find a way? Hafiza, what's the name of this school? Which school do you go to? South Mountain. Um, are you from that school, sir? Okay, so um, let my assistant take the name down of your school. Let's do some organizing around me coming next year to sit with you and your colleagues and have a conversation. So if, if you see that woman, she's American and I'm Liberian. If I don't come, she's responsible because she controls my life, but I would definitely come. Sir, can you share your contact with her? And early next year, once we have the time, Hafiza, we will arrange with your school, and Hafiza and I will come, and you will have a list of your friends, and we'll sit and talk to them about leadership and that they need to start being class rep, okay? Cool, girls. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Pumla Ngawa Adesanya. I'm a prospective graduate student. Uh, my question to you is, given the great success your work with girls has enjoyed all over the world, are there any plans in, in your organization or in collaboration with other organizations to replicate this work in boy children? <laughs> That's a, that's a beautiful question, um, and I think it's something that we need to do. I have two sons, and they are the most um, um, marginalized and suppressed group of boys in the world. <laughs> because I'm an African feminist, and it's all about feminism. The girls get this off, and the boys work like a dog. Um, that's the way it is. But on a more serious note, I think it's important for us to engage boys in everything we do. And this comes from a strong um, experience I had a year ago. Usually, when you have a situation where you're bringing young people together to talk about teenage pregnancy, the tendency to bring only girls is very high. So we had a situation where we had a room full of students. And the first question I asked them was, how many of you in this room are teen fathers, not teen mothers? Half of the boys in the room had their hands up. So I walk around in my old crazy way. So what happened? And one person raised their hand and said, I don't know. <laughs> Another person raised his hand and said, I pull out. <laughs> Another person raised his hand and said, it wasn't even exciting the dumbest questions, answers 
to that question. My staff, when we went back to office, were appalled. And everyone was talking at the same time. And I said, these boys have no problem. The problem is us. My take, in their entire lives, no man have sat those boys down to tell them that two seconds of unprotected sex could impregnate a girl. And that is when I knew we had work to do. And to conclude, my uncle would say, Lema, are you still empowering girls? And I say, yes, he say, wow. All right, keep on. Your educated girls will marry our own educated boys. I hear we have to end quickly, so quickly, if you all can just come. My name is George Gunpo. I'm a faculty in economics at Ramapo College. And I'd like to congratulate you for your Nobel Prize. And I'd also like to congratulate you on your courage, your recent action. where you decided to step aside from a high position as one of the commissioners, government official in Liberia, because perhaps there were constraints on your effectiveness. I think gave a lot of courage to so many people because in Liberia, this, what you did was difficult to do. Most of the time, people feel, as you said earlier, that people should always be praise singers. And what you did was highly courageous. My concern and question is on the issue of the conditions that existed, some of those conditions such as injustice, extreme poverty, neglect, lack of inclusiveness in policy making, tribalism, those things that gave rise to the civil crisis. And with all of the work that you've done in trying to end the crisis, it appears as those, those conditions have not changed substantially, especially in the area of poverty. And to me, it appears like if nothing is seriously done at the at the macro level to improve the situation, the country faces a high risk of returning to civil crisis. So what could be done? So, so my question is not really in terms of what could be done, but in terms of the extent to which you are, I know you are able, but to the extent to which you are ready to work with other Liberian groups or other groups that are prepared not just for for ideas, but to put ideas into action to help improve the situation at the macro level. Thank so you. you Thank you. I will handle that. Let me take the last two or three, and then I'll just put everything. Sorry about that, but I've been told we have to end. <laughs> Uh, first, I want to thank question. you. Yes, yes, question, real quick. Uh, uh, my name is Dr. Kafani. I'm the director of the Africana Institute at Essex County College. And so we do programs on bridging the gap between uh, diverse groups of people of African descent. So my question to you is, looking at some of the strategies that you've used uh, to address uh, some of those, the, the, the intense problems that you have, how do we, uh, what, what suggestions might you have for uh, you know, Africans from the continent, from the islands, from the United States, for us working together using some of those maybe strategies that you have to employ to, to really uh, take things to the next level in that course. All right. Thank you. Good evening. I'm very excited to meet you. I'm from Liberia. My name is Michael Gray. I work for Congressman Payne. I'm a director of Constituent Services and also an international liaison, liaison. I'd like to acknowledge Uncle Bell. Thank you for a uh, Oh, nice presentation. Uh, but uh, my thing is that uh, I travel to Liberia every year, and I hear about all the rosy story about Liberia. Uh, I've been in government for like 10 years now, working for Honorable Donald P. Jr. I've been very helpful in helping my country, but I see Liberia is extremely 
far from what people think Liberia is. We don't have all the basic things, no electricity, no water, no sewer system, educational system is not really good, uh, no road network, so we, how can we really tell the story? I mean, I've tried as much as possible to talk to the congressman to help. I mean, I want to be a helper, but the people need to know the true story so that we can help our nation. Hi, my name is Diego and I'm a law visiting student coming from Italy and here I'm writing my thesis about the institutionalization of peace building processes into the legal framework. My question is about youth participation in peace building processes. Uh, I'm advocating in this moment with an organization at the UN to create, to try to address and create a um, security council resolution about youth, peace and security as the resolution about women, peace and security. So do you believe that uh, a sort of this uh, resolution can empower young people into peace building processes? Thank you. You know, I'm not one of those who would call for more resolutions. We have enough to fill the world. <laughs> Implementation is a serious problem. Beyond that, implementation with action and resources. We have the UN Security Council 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. We've had subsequent resolution to, to strengthen that particular um, instrument. And all we see when we have peace talks, because it talks about prevention, participation, and uh, protection. All we see during peace talks from Syria to South Sudan is the same group of people leaving out women when we have one of the strongest resolution. I think when it comes to youth peace and security, the way to go is to start working with youth in communities, enhancing their ability to sustain peace and security. Because for example, in Africa, we have the largest youth population. And a report now say those group of young people will either, they're they are like a powder keg. They can be used for crisis and they can be used for good. So the question now is how do we begin to mobilize the youth population on our different con on the con different continents to ensure that they're engaged in peace processes, they're engaged in security processes, and they're engaged in economic development processes. Because until we do that, even with 10,000 resolution on peace and security for young people, we will continue to see failure in peace processes and young people being used as mercenaries and other um, vices during wars in different countries. To my brother Michael, you know, let me say one thing, and I'm going to say this emphatically. It's very difficult in the global order for you to tell a story about any nation, whether Liberia, Uganda, Burundi, or any country that the world has decided this is our narrative and we're not going to change it. When I criticize our president for corruption, nepotism, and all of the different things in this country, Women who have no stake in the Liberian politics will shun me when I go to programs. Even though that is, was a local political issue, it had global repercussions for me. I stood my ground. I remember going to an event in California and I walked in all my glam and glitz as an African woman, well-dressed. Nothing like this dress for the winter. <laughs> well dressed, everything was in place. Someone from the Obama administration, who is a high profile woman, walked up to me and said, oh my God, here comes the troublemaker. Of course I'm West African, and of course I had a response for her. My response, you forgot, my dear, that I won the Nobel Peace Prize for making trouble. <laughs> the beauty of standing your ground is that in June of this year, that same official met me in London and wanted to have a private meeting that you were right. I live for that moment. <laughs> Did I say anything to her? No, just smiled and walked away. You don't have to tell a story.
that is not the truth. Because the old people say, truth crushed to the earth will surely rise. Tell them the reality of Liberia, the reality of the Liberian people, and let them weigh it. If they want to shun you, fine. But this is the country that we live in. If that country has the problem that it has, it's up to us to tell the world it's not as glam and glitz as you all think. So my brother's question about what can we do? There are a lot of thinkers and there are a lot of people. Personally, I take a step back a lot of the times before engaging with any think tank group because most times they lack the sincerity about where they want to go. You get involved and in two months, you find out that people are looking for political position. So all of the conversation about change and change and change and change ends up coming to, can I get a ministerial position? And so I have been very careful in who I engage with, what I lend my name to, and what meetings I sit in. Do I worry about the state of affairs of our country? Yes, I do. In my little tiny foundation, we do schools for young people, and trust me, it has been a nightmare. I've gotten scholarships to some of the best schools in this country and Europe for Liberian students. They go to take TOEFL and other tests, and these are students who tap their schools, and they come back with the lowest grade. So every year we go back to universities that have given us four full year scholarship and say, can we defer enrollment? Can we defer enrollment? Because we cannot find the qualified students. I worry about it. I worry about the young girls who are still being used as sex objects. I worry about different things in that country. I do, I told myself, I've gotten to the place where I'm not going to be on the radio, not CNN, not BBC, especially during this Ebola time, because I will roll up my sleeves and raise as much as I can. And over the last few months, we've raised enough money to finance 90 local, 90 local organizations and 23 rural radio stations to do Ebola messaging for, messaging for their communities. So my, my take to every Liberian in this room, yes, we can talk, but the question you need to ask yourself, what can you do locally to change the tide? To the brother about the diaspora question, I think there's a lot of dialogue that needs to happen between Africans on the continent, those in America, and those in um, the Caribbean areas, because there are a lot of myth and misconceptions about each other, and I think we need to break it down. Africans, especially who come here to the U.S. and go to school, they go back. We've seen a new wave of Africans going back with a very condescending attitude that they've come, they know everything, and there's a serious resistance from people who have stayed on the continent. It's time to start talking because it's only in uniting that we'll be able to change the tide on our continent. I want to say thank you, and as you go out, let your local action inform some global response. Thank you all very much. like to ask everyone uh, uh, to enjoy the time, enjoy the moment. Thank you for engaging with us. Uh, we are very happy that uh, uh, we had this conversation. We will contribute to the uh, NGO, for the, your foundation, for, with a little contribution. Um, we will have... Uh, Many thanks to all. We are happy to be here. Please remain in the room as we, the DICE party left the stage. I look forward to seeing you again. This was a wonderful uh, World Leader Forum and we are delighted to have a local action leading us to global involvement. Thank you. Thank you.